Welcome back to Media GTAO and Southwest Studios. Good to have some new listeners as we ease into our holiday season. Um, Christmas, New Year's, all those good things. And Kwanzaa. So what are we doing here? Continuing the life and eventual death of Elliot Smith by reading Torment Saint by William Todd Schultz. And personally, it's good to be back here. I want to say thank you to the new subscribers. Um, <clears throat> get a lot of nasty comments, but then I get new subscribers and really nice comments, and I think we have to choose what we're going to focus on. <clears throat> Are we going to focus on the bullshit or the stuff where we actually make connections with people? And you can tell, and I'm, of course I'm talking about myself in these YouTube comments, but just in your general life. Are you going to focus on the positive stuff? People say, thank you so much, or people say, you're a real piece of shit. Now, um, there's some validity in that. Maybe we're small pieces of shit, but never as much as uh, some other unhappy people say, you know. And I'm almost, I almost just hit cut, you know, redo this. Because um, a lot of my comments had to do with, like, shut up, get to the content. And that's not what this channel is. I'll just reiterate at the beginning of this video. That is not what this channel is. Right now I'm doing an audiobook with commentary. <coughs> I will complete more audiobooks without commentary. But these rock star ones have my own perspective in them. You might be wondering why. And it's because I, as Courtney put it, I lived through this. I was... uh Alive during the 90s. The 90s had a big impression on me. I was there, man. And uh, I remember what happened. And oftentimes in these books, it's not what they say. So I am tired of the negative, you know, bullshit comments that are like, you hate women. It's like, well, it, yeah, that's also part of what this channel is. I'm kind of past all my red pill rage. Someone's asking, what is your name? Media G Tau? Yeah, and that comes from MGTOW, M-G-T-O-W. And all I can say about that is look it up. It's a man doing as he pleases, leading his own life, instead of doing it for a wife and 2.2 kids. And you can say, well, MGTOW Manor's sad little man who can't get laid anyway. That's fine. You know, we've heard your shaming language. Um, getting laid is not the end-all, be-all. And I've done it once before in my past, ladies and gentlemen. I did it once, and it was fantastic. Now, I've probably had sex more than once. That's up to you to determine. Certainly not really the focus of this channel, but it is to explain some of my thoughts on relationships and women are going to come in to the text when I'm doing commentary. And that's part of the deal, and you don't have to be here. For the ones that are here, understand that <coughs> I don't rant and rave about the evil ways of women anymore because I don't believe women are evil necessarily i just think they are as they are think of a snake snakes are weird and kind of gross and you don't want to be around them that's how women are and it shouldn't take away from the fact that we can talk about really creative men um i'm not sitting here reading a, an audiobook about you know amelia Earhart. even when you try to think of a famous woman it's hard to do and trust me this channel could be much more migtow centric and it's not at all i already went through that it's not interesting to me. You can go to TFM. <clears throat> All the shows that I listen to, Coach Greg Adams, who did I just subscribe to? Red Pill Men's Health, I think he calls himself. A lot of great MGTOW content creators out there. My channel is just informed by MGTOW. And so it's media going their own way. Just a clever little who's it right there. And the intent upon the inception of this channel was to dissect things like TV, movies, and, you know... If you look at something like Marriage Story, which is how I subscribe to Red Pill Men's Health, Marriage Story on Netflix, um, gosh, I so want to talk about it. I'll talk about it in a different video because this is supposed to be for Elliot, but just full of Red Pill truths and uh, not a very good movie and Scar Joe just looks horrible. And So why do I mention that? I don't know, guys, because this could be a MGTOW channel in some ways. It very much is, so don't act so surprised all right okay so heading into chapter eight of torment saint the life what do they call this yeah torment saint i think it's the life and death of elliot smith by william todd schultz
Chapter 8, A Symbol Meaning Infinity Around 1999, once the tour trailed off, and there was time to breathe again, to take stock and start imagining several possible futures, a signal event occurred that, retrospectively, many would point to as the start of a long train ride to hell, the most recent beginning of a dreadfully anticipated end. Elliot moved to L.A., it was where he would die four years later, and for some it was why he would die, as though grimy, smoggy, shallow Los Angeles bore down on a fragile target. Cracker Bash's Sean Krogan, for instance, took this position at first. The feeling was that had Elliot instead returned to Portland, his life might have been spared. Now even Krogan isn't so sure. I kind of call bullshit on that now. I don't know anything. All I know is that I loved him very much, and there are people in Portland, and obviously in L.A., who loved him a lot. At first, the relocation was meant to be temporary, a short-term necessity. Dory and Gary had moved into a four-bedroom apartment in New York with her boyfriend, and she took quite a bit of Elliot's stuff to the new place. Elliot asked if he could rent one of the rooms. He helped with the security deposit. He paid several months' fees, but he was almost never there. Finally, Gary told him what he was doing made no sense. He was wasting money. New York was where he wanted to be, but as Dorian figured out, he kept needing to stay in L.A. for industry-driven reasons. At last, mostly out of inertia, he wound up living there. The decision was made passively. In New York, as he often said, and as others like Ashley noticed, there's just more people that look like I do. Not that I don't look any particular way, I don't think, but I'm not the... People don't stare at me. I don't look outrageous at all. There's always much bigger freaks than me in New York on every block. L.A. was different. At first, he didn't feel quite right there. It was full of falsely tan people with great abs that wear impossible clothes, and I'm always the scrappiest person walking down the street, and it makes me uncomfortable. <coughs> Famous people had always left him feeling a little edgy. He avoided places where up-and-comers networked, talked about their careers incessantly, perpetually on the make. He mostly sidestepped Hollywood, he said. But the L.A. cartoon intrigued him. As he told CNN... That seemed like a good reason to check it out. Let's get the cartoon out of the way and see what it's really like there. Some of the impetus for the move came from manager Margaret Middleman. She really, really wanted him to live in L.A., believing that being close to her and to husband producer Rob Schnapp might be good for Elliot, a change of scenery, a possible change of mood. She looked forward to him getting to know her young assistant, Alyssa Siegel, to whom Elliot would grow close. Middleman figured Siegel and others, including photographer Autumn de Wild, who later produced a sort of oral biography on Elliot, replete with hundreds of photographs, would be a good influence in his life. Yet as she and others quickly realized, though L.A. did seem to help for a bit, manufacturing for Elliot a host of salutary music-focused distractions the effect was temporary. Elliot was always going to be drawn to a dark crowd, says DeWild, and that was always going to be frustrating for the people who were looking out for him. The crepuscular red-walled roost was one typical hangout. Elliot spent hours there alone, drinking beer and writing, bartenders protecting his privacy just as they had done in New York. Schnaff recalls one exchange, a night he told Elliot he needed either to deal with this shit except the fact that it wasn't working, the drinking, the habitually gloomy frame of mind, or go down that other path. On one hand, Elliot's people radar helped him pinpoint the good souls he needed in his life. On the other, he sometimes felt as if he could not live up to his own expectations, a mindset encouraging self and relational sabotage. Everybody's got a story, DeWild said. There was the funny point with Elliot, usually just after meeting him. He was very good with strangers, said DeWild. There was the inspiring point, 
the dawning recognition of his uniqueness, his giftedness. Then there was the disappointing point, the moment he disappeared, flaked, failed to stick to the straight and narrow, made the destructive rather than the healthy choice. To Schnaff, the goal of steering Elliot toward the right path was almost hopeless. He so often seemed at root to be dealing with irreversible damage. The damage might be momentarily muted, but that was about it. It came back. It fought through demonically. Some of this was Elliot himself, who he was, the strategies he had evolved for dealing with negative emotion, booze, psych meds, self-erasure. Some was the people crowding in on him, drawn like humming insects to the fame flame. Polymath Nelson Gary, a whirlwind of esoteric literary and philosophical knowledge, a writer and painter and rock aficionado, crossed paths with Elliot accidentally during these years, and later got to know him fairly well, even appearing in one of his songs, Coast to Coast. Gary was acutely aware of what he called the sycophant, madding crowd of banditos, following Elliot around, yes, men and women, self-obsessed enablers, one of whom, Gary says, looked like Chico Marx. When Elliot wanted to go dark, they were there, dimming the flashlight. When Elliot wanted to hear only what he wanted to hear, they said the right words. Okay, we'll take a small break there as I read ahead in the text. It looks like a good breaking point as we kind of establish that Elliot has moved to Los Angeles and not Portland like some thought he might do, given that he was there before New York. So just to recall, because obviously I've, we've been doing these videos in dribs and drabs over the months. Um, yeah, and I'm not going to do the whole thing, but Elliot was born in Texas. I want to say Austin, but I forget, and it's not Austin. But he's born in Texas and raised in Portland, Oregon. And then as he's gaining his musical chops in the uh, mid-90s to late 90s, a couple of years previous to where we are right now, um, and we're in 1999 right now, recall. Um, so he's in Portland in the mid-90s, and then New York in the late 90s, and then finally, around this time, 99, decides to move to L.A. Okay. And that's what's leaving some of his old friends a little bit baffled. Um, they think it's maybe not the best for him, and uh, since he's dead now, they look back on it and say, well, it was L.A. that killed him. Um, and then his one buddy is saying, eh, that's probably a little bit over dramatic, but there's some truth to that. And of course, I'm not just recapping to hear myself talk. I think it's important. You know, we're establishing that Elliot is now in L.A., um, a city where I know he had visited before, um, but never lived there. And so he's hanging out with these sycophants and weirdos, uh, kind of yes men, right? It's his hype men of the late 90s. Um, and you are the company you keep, as we see in the case of Kurt Cobain and Love and Death and that video series. Check that out if you haven't yet. But this is perhaps the beginning of the end, I think, the case that Elliot's friends are making as well as the author here. Back to the text. In early 1999, Elliot responded to a set of questions for NME in a piece titled Elliot Smith on the Couch. <clears throat> His answers read like a mini-life review, touching on many of the experiences of the prior few years, along with their emotional sequela. Posh restaurants full of winners. I hate winners, was his answer to the question, what is hell? The song he felt described him best, another question posed to him, was Quasi's Success Can Only Fail Me Now, a reply italicizing his attitude toward mainstream acceptance and the constant ambivalence attending his pursuit of recognition for his music. Like the earliest memories recalled by most people who fight depression, his was less than positive, albeit comical. He remembered finding a turtle in Dallas that peed on his hand. Pause. There's your answer, Media Gito. Uh, Dallas, Texas is where he was born and then spent his childhood. Unpause. <clears throat> At first it was cool, then it wasn't. As for the worst trouble he had been in, 
he tracked back to the week he spent on the psychiatric unit in Arizona. Then, asked on whom he would most like to extract revenge, he named one of the doctors there, someone he'd like to have incarcerated for a week, a sentence fitting the one meted out to him, a turning of the tables. A year and a half later, the intervention betrayal still stung. He wasn't over it, nor would he ever really be. By mid-May 1999, the arduous XO tour was concluding, the experience of living out of an eight-wheel steel tube near its end. For some of these gigs, for instance an appearance in Minneapolis at the First Avenue Club, where Prince's Purple Rain concert footage was filmed, Joanna Baum was on hand, the on-again, off-again relationship temporarily back on, apparently, although an article describes her as a traveling companion. In fact, it was never entirely off. For the next several years, he would fly to Portland intermittently in order to see her. He felt, he told friends, that she was the woman he was supposed to marry. He wanted the relationship to work, but at the same time he doubted his ability to carry it off. Committing meant getting better, drinking less, primarily, and making positive life choices, for the sake of his partner, if not for himself. It meant living, pushing self-harm stirrings decisively aside. But that was the rub. He was never convinced he had it in him to effect the necessary changes. Throughout 1999, the older XO songs were slowly replaced by newer tunes during performance, many of which found spots on the next record, the one that would be Elliot's last. The Couple Killer single, Son of Sam, entered the set list in Tokyo in January. One month later, it was Everything Reminds Me of Her and Easy Way Out. Even the comparatively old Flowers for Charlie showed up in late March. The next night, Elliot announced, understandably, that he was sick of playing his songs. Night after night, it had mainly been the same old stuff, and it was getting exhaustingly formulaic. He abandoned the set list and took requests. But still, more new tunes came to the rescue. There was Wouldn't Mama Be Proud in July in Olympia, the devastating Can't Make a Sound, and even more devastating King's Crossing, on the same October night in Portland at Satyricon. XO had been a definite game-changer, but he was in the process of moving on, bringing in still more instrumentation, growing more lyrically adventurous, more imagistic and elliptical. The songs, at any rate, always took care of themselves. They rolled on like a semi, headlights tearing through the night. They came out of their own sequestered life force, impervious to tumult, swimming in the flood and counting the waves, just like the female character in the song Baby Britain. Summer of 1999 brought with it a new main character, one who would play a key role in Elliot's final moments. At Spaceland, he first met Jennifer Chiba. He had wandered in just as she'd finished a gig. Chiba played bass in a band called The Warlocks. Mutual friend Steve Hanft was there too, and Elliot asked for an introduction. He and Jennifer talked some about compassion and Russian literature, about the Ferdinand story, one of Chiba's favorites from childhood too, both staring at their shoes, both smiling shyly. To Chiba, Elliot seems really uncomfortable, his usual transient awkwardness showing. He had just moved to L.A., he didn't even know his phone number, so he asked for hers, then gave her the number of Middleman's assistant. Chiba's first instinct was to tell him to call her when he dropped out of the music industry. She'd recently ended a 10-year relationship with Weezer's Rivers Cuomo. And in the moment, she didn't feel she could deal with being in the public eye again. She knew who Elliot was. She had seen him on the Oscars in his white suit, and she'd been blown away, finding his songs amazing and breathtaking. Okay, well, I have to interject here. Because I did not know that. If you couldn't tell, I had no idea 
that Jennifer Chiba was Rivers Cuomo's ex-girlfriend of 10 years. I mean, that is a hefty chunk of change. I mean, that's the Blue Album. It's Pinkerton. Okay, so I didn't know he's writing about this bitch the whole time. That's where I can see your comments. Listen, Jennifer Chiba is a bitch. Half of you probably think she killed Elliot Smith, which is where I kind of draw the line. I don't think I don't think that, but you never know because it was just the two of them in that house, and they'll get to that. His friends and medical authorities will get to that towards the end of this book. A couple of videos from now, we'll talk about that. Um, teaser. So, Jennifer Chiba, uh, of course, I need to look at some photos of her to see. No, I don't know. Rivers Cuomo never really had very good taste anyway. He's a w weirdo little creep. I mean, to think that Courtney Love and Jennifer Chiba, uh, just by being the crazy hoes, manipulative rock star fuckers that they are, have inspired somehow some of the best tunes of the 90s. It's kind of sad in a way. It's kind of disappointing. Um, but of course it was going to be that way. You know, Kurt and Rivers were probably never going to date super normal women, neither was Elliot, but this was a bad choice, Jennifer Chiba, right? Rivers, X, why not stay with Joanna Ball? I don't know. Obviously, we can, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Weeks later, Elliot showed up at her next gig. There they talked more, discovering surprising commonalities. Chiba had grown up in Africa, but moved to Texas, graduating high school in Houston, where she was a standout student and attending college at Trinity in San Antonio, finishing up in 1989. Her father was a NASA scientist in Zimbabwe. He remarried at 70, Chiba's mother having died in 1993. Like Elliot, Chiba had pushed through her share of emotional storms. She had been hospitalized for depression and suicidal thinking, and she shared with Elliot all the medical, co all the medication cocktails I was on, adding that most made me feel worse. In what she later understood to be a fugal medicated state, an episode of altered consciousness, she had tried taking her own life, and Elliot seemed extremely interested in the details. She found she could talk with him without shame and he told her of his own experience at Sierra Tucson. They agreed that hospitalization sucked. Confinement, they felt, made things worse, not better. As for the drugs, they spent hours comparing notes. Both concluded meds seemed at best fractionally helpful, their idiopathic nature a source of frustration. Even when they worked, no one knew why or whether they'd keep working or for how long. They also believed that we had the right to live or not live as we saw fit. That was the problem with confinement. The freedom it limited included the freedom to die. It prevented the ultimate escape. In forcing life upon patients, it seemed like a form of death, a curtailment of limitless possibility, suicide included. Moved by her candid descriptions of what she'd been through, sympathizing with her pain, Elliot told Chiba, I hope you don't try to hurt yourself again because I'd like to get to know you better. For her, this was an astounding thing to hear, coming as it did from someone she so admired and respected, someone she instantly adored. On the spot, they reached a provisional agreement. Neither of us would hurt ourselves. This came as a relief to Chiba, however fragile the pact turned out to be. At that time, she felt she needed external motivation. She could not rely on herself to provide the will to live, or even to take care of herself. She had no interest in bringing Elliot down with her, so the fact that he had been there that he'd spent a good amount of time feeling similarly, and therefore understood, provided much-needed hope. Here was someone who got it. Someone who knew what it was like. Someone in daily search of a reason to keep fighting.
Uh, I'm going to pause real quick because now I feel like a real asshole. No, I, I can understand, you know, people bonding over their trauma and even down to the details of their medications and confinement, right? This is very bonding when you feel, I think what stuck out to me in that chunk is this idea of being able to talk to someone without shame about experiences that are really painful to you and traumatic. Being able to just lay it out there to somebody and know that they're not going to judge you is huge. I think we call those people friends. And I think we also call them lovers and husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends and partners and family, too. It doesn't really get much closer than that. And that's why I feel like an asshole. And I've also been in this kind of situation where um, there's two girls I can think of, two ex-girlfriends of mine, where we shared some similar history and just things that we'd done or just weird shit that we ended up kind of bonding over. And for chicks, that stuff's meaningful to them. You know, trauma and if someone can understand them. But with Elliot being a very sensitive soul and, you know, at least half female himself, it's not a surprise to me that they bonded over these things. Now, as I read ahead shortly, we see, though, that even with all this bonding, well, let's continue. But like always, it was touch and go, the agreement more fragile than ironclad. They liked each other, that much was clear. It was possible to envision a future, maybe not always a rosy one, maybe not one bereft of all pain, but a future nonetheless, a way of possibly being together. So Chiba immediately asked, what do you propose we do about it? Elliot's answer was unexpected but characteristic. I'm too depressed for a serious girlfriend. Chiba, of course, was depressed, too. She didn't see why shared mood problems ought to disqualify the positive feelings they seemed to have, but Elliot held back. He wasn't sure he had it in him to stay alive, agreements notwithstanding. In fact, as he told Chiba, he'd been entertaining the possibility of dying accidentally, so as not to hurt those who loved him using drinking and drugs as instruments of self-cessation. Plus, there was Joanna. How could he like Chiba, he wondered, if he was supposed to be with Joanna? Chiba says Elliot felt as if he had ruined her life, and sometimes when he returned from Portland, he'd be super depressed. All the same, he loved Joanna. In many ways, she was the one constant in his life, apart from the music, which she was indirectly a part of, at least in terms of the recording process. It was all very frustrating, confusing, a mixed bag of hopefulness and clear-headed self-doubt, but in the end, Chiba came away impressed, if not undeterred. Elliot seemed unwilling, admirably so, to allow his demons to destroy a relationship with someone else. He said he wished they had met at a different time, For her part, Chiba knew what they shared wouldn't evaporate. She told him she'd always be there, yet privately wondered whether she could wait for him to go through whatever it was he had to go through. This turned out to be a prescient question. What Elliot was about to go through flung him into an abyss. Wondering if I should stop. No, I wouldn't do that to you. 55 minutes is our is our goal. I don't think we're going to finish chapter 8 today, y'all, but we'll see. We will see. For now, that abyss was still one year off, and there was plenty to take his thoughts away from inner checkmates. For one thing, his grandmother died, and after taping a John Bryan show at the Santa Monica Pier, he had to fly out the next morning. This turned out to be the first time Elliot hung out with Alyssa Siegel. He worried about getting to the funeral on time, so she wound up volunteering to stay with him at his hotel. That's how stressed out he would get, Siegel says. He didn't ask me to stay, I offered. It was clear he couldn't deal with the idea of doing it by himself. 
He slept as Siegel finished a crossword puzzle. When she got him to the airport, Iggy Pop was also on the flight. A strangely reassuring coincidence. <laughs> I'm trying not to interject, I promise. But yes, if Iggy Pop is on my flight, I'm going to feel good about it. First of all, I don't care if that plane is going down, baby. I'll fucking crash with Iggy Pop. I mean, if if Iggy Pop is on your flight, you're good. That's all I'm saying. Back from the funeral, he recorded later in 1999 the Lennon tune Because for the American Beauty soundtrack. The film released in September. It was note perfect, as George Martin proclaimed, a slow build of texture, all soaring multiple falsetto harmonies that, at first, Elliot did not think he was up to. When the film came out, he hesitantly made his way to the after party, its location marked by strewn rose petals. As Autumn Day Wild recalled jokingly, he was miserable. Showbiz stuff was never his thing. He was more at home in dive bars like Club TG or The Roost, at least on nights when they weren't overrun by frat boys from local colleges. But it was a triumph. Here he was in yet another film. His star kept rising, whether he liked the attention or not. Siegel recalls another moment that inspired, in an indirect fashion, the concept for the next album. She and Elliot were driving around L.A. Like in high school with Garrett Duckler, he drove around all the time, and when he did, there was always music playing, his own or someone else's. And she slid into the car stereo a tape with songs from the kids' TV show Schoolhouse Rock. Jazz singer and pianist Blossom Deary had lent her bright, childlike voice to three of the tunes— Mother Necessity, Unpack Your Adjectives, and Figure Eight. On the latter, Deary's sharp, sharp-edged vocal punctures the unspeakably eerie Saturnine roll of the piano. The effect is transporting, the song in its first and final portion seeming to issue from some gloomy, vestigial portion of an infantile unconscious, like a dream one wakes to partly recall pause. The reason I'm fucking stumbling over stupid sentences like that, Schultz, you son of a bitch, is because you're writing like it's your last day on earth. Cut it out. Unpause. The middle portion of the song gets a lot more bouncy, with Deary singing multiplication tables. She concludes with a high vocal run. Place it on its side and it's a symbol meaning infinity. As Siegel remembers, the two listen to the tape several times, its atmospherics registering strongly. Strongly? When Elliot got back to his house, he sat down at the piano and worked figure eight out. Then sometime in July or August at Capitol Studios in L.A., he recorded it along with numerous other songs, including the piano piece by Junk Bond Trader, Color Bars, and everything reminds me of her. Elliot's version of the figure eight piece models itself on Deary's, although he recorded just the first section and with less instrumentation. There's the same juxtaposition of crisp vocals with a muffled, faraway piano. The song's theme of a circle turning around upon itself struck a nerve. It's a picture inescapably of infinite repetition. To Eliot it suggested the dead-endedness of flawlessness, a kind of going nowhere and going somewhere at the same time. This idea of endlessly skating the very symbol of infinity, a Beckett-like stasis in the midst of apparent motion, stuck. It appealed to Eliot's Kierkegaardian leanings, the nausea and pointlessness and absurdity of existence, Suggesting, as he explained, a self-contained pursuit that potentially could be kind of beautiful and has no destination. One can't get out of it, he added, without ruining it. I kind of like that. The song itself, Figure Eight, never made it onto a record. It was 
There until the last minute when it was replaced by Easy Way Out, he explained. The song got dropped, but not its sentiment. Elliot, de- Elliot elected to name the album after the Deary Schoolhouse Rock tune. Figure 8 captured where he was at, where he was always at, the majesty of, in his way of thinking, going nowhere. In interviews leading up to the record release, the usual probings came, this time made more piquant by a perception of stardom. Sitting for these was its own figure eight. At times it appeared no one ever came up with anything new to ask, the questions recycling themselves, tracing identical arcs forever. Was he a loner? Were his songs autobiographical? Why were his songs so sad? What did he expect people to feel when listening to the record? Does his music have a healing effect? At times, he was obviously annoyed by the sameness. For VH1, he sat with tightly crossed legs and tapping toes, far crankier than usual, determined to say as little as possible, a blonde female interviewer growing growing more flummoxed by the second. I'll pause because I'm stuttering, but also because this is very reminiscent of the reporters and journalists trying to get Bob Dylan to answer for his songs, as seen in Don't Look Back and No Direction Home by D.A. Pennebaker and Martin Scorsese, respectively. And they're trying to get him to say, you know, well, I'm a genius, or yeah, this is really about the truth of man or something, and And Cobain said the same thing, which is, just listen to the music, man. It's all in the music. So these guys don't want to talk about it. And, of course, journalists and reporters being what they are, who they are, uh, basically, you know, pretty simple-minded people who are out for the facts. How are you going to get the facts about a song? I mean, look at what they asked. Um, does his music have a healing effect? That's very similar to what one of the reporters asked Dylan. Um, you know, just, are you the spokesman for a generation? Just these kind of dumb things. Uh, you, you would think you could ask Bob Dylan a better question. You know, let's, let's think of one. Let's think of a better question right now to ask Elliot Smith. Um, you know, what do you find yourself usually writing about. I think they touched on that were with were his songs autobiographical. But why were his songs so sad? You're you're asking someone basically like were you raped as a kid, which he may have been, right? I think what the paragraph here is getting at as far as how Elliot felt is just being tired of doing the press junket and answering the same questions all day. But it really made me think of yeah, 35 years earlier, you know, 30 years earlier, with the same thing going on with reporters and journalists, music journalists, asking Bob Dylan, what are you doing here? And he doesn't know. He's just writing it down, oftentimes because it rhymes and it sounds good. Same thing with Cobain, and believe it or not, with Elliot Smith here. That's not to, I mean, trust me, this stuff is, as you know, packed full of meaning, highly autobiographical. Um, but sometimes the words and the way they rhyme themselves and present themselves as you're drinking a beer in a bar and you're just chilling, it works out. It works out as if it was predestined by God himself. And people like Elliot Smith, Cobain, Beatles, Dylan, I won't say all the Beatles. Ringo Ringo is not a channel for God. Okay. No, one, no one thinks God is coming through Ringo. You never heard that said. Oh, Ringo is touched by... Ringo's touched, that's for sure. He's certainly been touched by something. All right? Chromosomally. (laughs) But Ringo (laughs) has no connection towards God. The other three, all right? Uh, John, George, Paul, those guys were touched by God. You get what I'm saying. These people are vessels for God, and they don't claim to take credit. Hopefully, they've worked on being humble. And you know for a fact, Elliot was humble. So, I say all that because he's getting tired of answering the same questions, many of which are really dumb questions, and you kind of can't blame him. Um, Yeah, continuing. 
but sometimes he rose to the occasion. John Movey singled out his maddening, maddening inconsistency, telling him, Come on, check your script. To which Elliot shouted, Everybody's inconsistent. Everybody pretends they are more coherent so that other people can pretend that they understand them better. That's what you have to do. If everybody really acted like how they felt all the time, it would be total madness. There is an interesting exchange on the subject of autobiographical source material, a topic Elliot always tried finessing as best he could, saying for the record, I will do anything I can within my power to prevent myself becoming just another cartoon rock star with all manner of dysfunctions. Well, at the same time, occasionally, in ways not within his power, doing anything but. His songs, he emphasized, are dreams, little movies. You can watch if you want, he noted, but the aim wasn't to make people feel like he did. Interpretations focused on personal secrets he found insulting. True songs for me are about mystery. Their charm is that they are open-ended. The notion that he is that he just has a bunch of issues he unloads on strangers? Not the case, he maintained. Still, when questioned specifically, when asked in detail about what sound like cogent hypothetical readings of lyrics, he allowed, maybe, as he blows cigarette smoke towards the window, from which he'd presumably like to make his getaway. The difference seems to be between what the songs are often truly about and the myth Eliot would prefer to represent. He admits that certain songs on the new record did have something to do with, for instance, the lingering resentments about Sierra Tucson, then quickly adds, I don't want to perpetuate the notion that if somebody plays music, they must be fucked up or crazy. Interjecting. Yeah, I mean, gosh, this guy, I, sure, some of the blame is on me, Media g for, but you, you should see, I've had to omit words from this guy's sentences sometimes because no one's ever heard of these words. Um, and I've heard of a lot of words. But anyway, he's talking about exactly what we just mentioned here, guys and gals. Um, it's very insulting for the media to be like, uh, did you just write this because you were molested? I mean, what is the sentence? And I quote, Interpretations focused on personal secrets he found insulting, end quote, page 266. That is insulting. Um, and even if it is, who's, I mean, that's just, why would you ask about it? Be smarter. Just listen to the lyrics and you'll understand that someone was abused, or they at least felt they were abused. And it's not up to Elliot to answer to that. Uh, as Bob Dylan said, would you ask the Beatles that? You know? And the truth is, no, they wouldn't. They would not ask the Beatles that. As with... Continuing, sorry. As with Magical Mystery Tour and earlier records, at the time, Elliot was obsessed with what might be, by critical consensus, one of the most fucked up and crazy albums ever made. Nico's The Marble Index... He called it the perfect antidote to L.A. He liked how it put him in a trance. Nothing moved except the vocals, he said, monotonously wavering over static music. The record came out in 1969, the year of Elliot's birth. Nico wrote the songs and played her signature harmonium. Avant-garde composer and former Velvet Underground member John Cale arranged, adding glockenspiel electric viola, bells, mouth organ, and bosun's pipe. Nico's musical pedigree is dense. At Warhol's suggestion, she appeared on the Velvet Underground's debut album, as, in keeping with Warhol's stylings, Chanteuse. Dylan wrote a song for her, and the Stones' Brian Jones recorded her first single, produced by Jimmy Page, no less. Assorted efforts to come to terms with the Marble Index read like reluctant, frankly terrified night terrors. Trouser Press called it one of the scariest records ever made. The Guardian found it remarkable, possessing the annihilating beauty of a later Mark Rothko painting, Elliot's favorite artist, then added forewarningly, 
If you're ever in the mood to play the marble index, then it's probably the last thing you should be playing. Even Lester Bangs weighed in in a piece titled Your Shadow is Scared of You, an attempt not to be frightened by Nico. The vocals to Bangs call to mind twisted pterodactical shrieks. The harpsichord jabs like murderous hailstones, Nico herself lying interred in the endless wastes of the Arctic night. The record, in short, is a brief re reactive psychosis, a sort of schizophrenic apophony. Musically, there is zero affinity between the songs Elliot was recording at the time and the songs Nico made. What thrilled him more than the sound was the record's absolute apartness, its originality and uncategorizability. His goal, if there was one, was to make figure eight indescribable. In other words, to make it a little like the Marble Index, or like Rothko. We're going to pause there to talk about this idea, which I really like. Um, as these great artists that you and I admire and still listen to, uh, maybe they influence us in our own kind of work, whatever it is, such as, you know, this uh, episode, this podcast that you're listening to right now. And I wouldn't be doing this, obviously, if Elliot hadn't lived such a great life and had such great music. What we tend to forget is that our favorite artists are often obsessed with some other artist, as our favorite artists are creating a Nevermind or a Magical Mystery Tour or a Marble Index, right? And it just goes on and on. That's one great thing about music. And, of course, I am inspired now to check out this Marble Index. One thing that I really like is uh, everything's available on Spotify or wherever. So I'll check that out. I never really got too into the Velvet Underground and Nico. Um... Yeah, but I would like to check out her screeching to see if there's... I mean, listen, I'm sure it's great if Elliot used it as the inspiration for figure eight, as well as the uh, Schoolhouse Rock thing I didn't know about. So I'm learning as we go along. I've read this before, but it was years ago, and I was stoned, so I'm sure I'll forget all this again. Luckily, we have it on... We used to say tape back in my day. Uh, now we have it on tube, I guess. So, yeah, we just... Uh, the reason I paused is we... The cool thing about it is that, as he said, it's the author and Elliot, it's not really... Okay, I'll quote. Musically, there is zero affinity between the songs Elliot was recording at the time and the songs Nico made. What thrilled him more was... What thrilled him more than the sound was the record's absolute apartness. End quote. Um, yeah, so really just using it as an inspiration along with Rothko to be more of a soundscape and indescribable. I will say Figure 8 is my favorite of Elliot's records. Um, I think, I always I always get that in XO. You know, Figure 8 and XO are definitely my two. Uh, but it is hard to say. It is hard to say. So the point is he's using these other artists as an inspiration, but not directly. More as an idea. You know, you could even say say what you will about Kanye West, but he thinks along the same lines. That's where genius is, genii. It's it's hard to say. Are there genii in art and music? If there are, you know, we'll just say if there are, they draw inspiration from other kinds of medium and categories and, li you know, areas of life that really have nothing to do often with their their art. You know, Elliot's talking Rothko, he's talking Nico, still within the arts, but... And then you've got Kanye being into uh, furniture or something, because to him it's all art. And uh, I don't, you know, I haven't even listened to Kanye's new album. I don't think it's good. Um, sure, he's mentally ill. I don't know why we say that like it's a negative. There's plenty of people who are mentally ill. Does he need some kind of medication? Maybe. He'd be one of many. Maybe he's bipolar too. Not to get off track and talk about Kanye West for too long. Um, why are we judging Kanye so harshly? Because he likes Trump? You know, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, all black people are supposed to, what, love Hillary Clinton? This country's... Okay, now I'm getting way off topic. But Kanye would be an example of an artistic genius because of his ability to think not just outside the box, but, uh, you know, the, the entire universe is available to him if he wants to. And maybe Kanye is a bad example, okay? But you get where I'm going. <laughs> maybe I should just shut up. 
should be the tagline of the show. Continuing. Because I would like to try to finish this chapter. Let's just see how much left we have. Mm, it's not going to happen, folks. Not going to happen today, especially as we near our 55-minute mark. I'll read a little bit more, and then we'll call it a day. Um, the good news is, for myself and for you, this book's almost over. So it might be one more video or two videos to conclude. And as I said, I'm on break, so I will be starting a new audiobook, probably without commentary. It's a relief, I know, to a lot of you YouTubers who you listen, but you hate me. So that's an interesting relationship, uh, although I certainly have that with other podcasts. We'll read a little bit more, call it a day, and there'll be more videos for you coming up later this week. Page 267. Thankfully, life in its zanier moments punted Elliot out of the Nico days. On New Year's Eve 1999, he was back in New York playing the Knitting Factory, a gig he closed with the song Last Call. Afterwards, Rye Coalition's Dave Lido, whose band featured a brashy Jesus lizardy mix with Led Zeppelin and ACDC, threw what he called an epic. Y2K party with Dorian Gary. Lito lived next door. That was the worst sentence I've ever read. Continuing. Elliot dropped in after the show in a hooded full-length red robe and slippers. By the time he arrived, everyone was totally wasted. They had gotten their hands on a smoke machine. Elliot set it off over and over until it triggered the fire alarm, then ran off screaming and dancing. You could not see the person in front of you, the smoke was so thick. He and Leto tore through Gary's record collection in search of the Stones' performance album, which, once located, they played on repeat for ten hours. He was obsessed with that album too, Leto notes. Leto, in fact, spent a lot of time hanging out with Elliot in the New York days, back when he was just a dude at Dorian's. Then, it was all jokes, seeing if you could push the limit to the most vulgar thing you could think of, cross the line type of stuff. On occasions when Elliot was asked to DJ in Brooklyn, Lido came along. Mobs of Brooklyn kids would crowd around, he remembers, saying, Hey, I'm a huge fan. Strangers were always trying to get a piece of him, make a connection. They felt like they knew him. He was always so courteous with everyone, but... After a certain point, we felt like we needed to make an escape. For Lido, these exchanges epitomized Elliot's attitude toward fan worship. He had zero care for money, fame, adulation. All he wanted to do was make music. When Dave and Dorian came upon some of the stuff he'd left behind in the move to L.A., they found sizable checks he didn't bother to cash, as if the money meant nothing. The songs brought the money, but the money wasn't the reason for the songs. Okay. We are going to leave it there for today. It's been a pleasure reading um, from Torment Saint by William Todd Schultz, The Life and Death of Elliot Smith. Uh, we concluded on page 268, uh, about two-thirds of the way through chapter 8. And it was a bit stuttery today, that's for sure. I'm getting my sea legs back. But it also doesn't help, as you have noted, that this guy writes some weird sentences sometimes. You know. Nevertheless, the book is a great source of information. I feel I've learned a bunch today. And again, I want to thank the new subscribers at this point. What you can do for me is very simple. Hit that like button uh, and leave a comment. That's about all I ask. So I'll be back for you later this week with more Elliot Smith as we close out this audiobook with commentary. And this has been Media Gito saying, have a nice day.